it, 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 it seems like fitting to to you, you win it out, win it out the competition, narrowed it down to two, That's and now and, and now we're gonna have our stand up. WWE. That's right. Oh yeah! <laughs> That's right. <laughs>
I, I remember this one particular night I was walking home. Uh, I had been in an astronomy class and we were on top of this building looking at some of the moons of Jupiter and, and talking about the ga galaxy and the cosmos and whatever. And the professor was going on about the Big Bang and the billions of stars. And I was thinking to myself, I, I can't believe this is just chance and this is all there is. There's got to be a God who designed this. And I was just awed by the mag magnitude of the universe. But on the other hand, this problem of evil, how could a God who can create this universe allow this terrible, you know, millions of kids getting gassed in gas chambers. And, and, oh, and the movie Sophie's Choice had just come out, which was a, a, a gut-wrenching where a woman has to choose which of her children she's going to have be sent to the gas chamber. And so I was just going back and forth on this, and, and uh, on this October night, and I came back to my car, uh, and I was like going, my, my head was like a ping-pong ball. There's got to be a God, there can't be a God. And as I was getting in the car, and I didn't know much about this, I thought, and some of it I said out loud, but I finally said, if you're up there looking down at, at us in this misery that you have helped create, I have a moral obligation to not believe in you. Uh, the only way I could possibly believe in you is if you're on the inside of knowing what it's like to be the mother who has to choose which of her children is going to go to the gas chamber, and you're on the inside of what it is to be the kid who wasn't chosen. Uh, it, 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 then I could, if, if you're on the inside of our suffering, then I can believe in you. And as I got in the car, all of a sudden the light bulb went off. It's just as I was turning on the car, a light bulb went off. And I think it was the Lord telling me, uh, it's like, what do you think the cross is all about? The cross is God getting on the inside of our pain. Now, I didn't at that point have an explanation for it, but there I had like the heart solution. Whatever else I've been thinking about the problem of evil, this is the only kind of God I could possibly believe in. And I, I've, I've held that conviction ever since. Hmm. Were there any other... Uh as you were sorting through how to make sense of that, were there any other theodicies that you kind of had to work your way through before you landed on being an open theist? No. I, 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 oh, yeah, be, before I became an open theist, yeah, yeah. That, that was down the road quite a ways. Right. Uh, that, that, that was years later, and a combination of reading Scripture and working through. I mean, I, I tried out just about everything. Uh, but I never let go of the idea that, that the only God who's believable is the God who's on the inside of our pain. That's why the whole doctrine of impassibility, the impassibility of God, I think is, to me, it, 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 I'll be an atheist. If, that's, if I have to believe that, uh, my whole faith is predicated on God's passibility, his willingness to enter into, uh, and come in solidarity with, to incarnate himself in our human condition and in our hell. Uh, it, it, that, that, that didn't solve any of the problems, but it gave me an emotional hook that, that has carried me through all the problems. As I keep thinking about this, I will always trust that that's the real, the true nature of God is found on the cross. Hmm. What about for you, Tom? Did you have any similar kind of aha moment or a, a significant turning point for you where you just really felt like Greg really was struck by this emotional weight, not just, uh, you know, some sort of rational syllogism, you know, that he was really struck by this. Did you have a similar experience as well at any point in your life? No, not not really, and nothing as dramatic as what Greg just described. I mean, it was something that I had been thinking about probably since junior high, and you know, looking at the world, seeing pain and suffering. My own life, you know, wasn't any more painful than a lot of other people's lives. I didn't have a you know a blissful childhood. It was a perfect, but it was better than a lot of people. Um, so I don't think of a particular moment being a turning point, but it is true that when I was 19, my first year of college, eight people in my life who were friends or family died in one year. Mm, wow. um, and they all died of kind of different kinds of things. You know, um, I think sometimes when we think about evil, we might have someone who, let's say, dies of cancer. And we can maybe think about how, okay, maybe cancer is, I don't know, teaching us a lesson or it's the devil or whatever. We kind of maybe have an answer. But then someone else dies of a freak accident. And then we'll say, well, in that case, you know, uh, something weird happened. So we, we kind of have these uh, Band-Aid kind of explanations for isolated incidents. But when you get a barrage of deaths in one year, and there are all kinds of different deaths and different sources um, I think in some ways that kind of cued me up for looking for a more comprehensive approach. Not that I had it then in any, by any means, but I realized I needed something more than just the free will defense, let's say, that mm -hmm. you know, we have freedom and, and I, I couldn't explain cancer 
with the free will defense, at least in the normal uh, ex, uh, views of it. So I think that probably was a turning point for me. Both of you have described something that seems to be a common feature of um, what we've seen, I think, for theologians, philosophers of the past, and even just lay Christians in their day-to-day experience, right? Few things disorient. We've got this, one of my central theses of this podcast is that central to our human experience is the effort to find and make meaning in the world. That's one of the things that makes us unique as humans, as a species, is that we're storied creatures, we search for meaning in the world, and few things disorient our meaning-making systems quite like an experience of suffering. Um, it disorients the so- and disorients our, our sense of who God is, the stories we've believed about God, um, especially when we cannot find an, a, a suitable way for that suffering to make sense or even have some purpose. Like you're saying, Tom, the the experience of seeing, for example, like natural evil, you might have had a framework to say, well, here's the free will defense, the standard free will defense, and that helps me make sense of why, you know, uh, uh, someone when they were murdered, why that murder happened to them. There's a clear causal connection. But natural evils might have disoriented you in a unique way. In an effort to help people uh, explore the different ways Christians have tried to make sense of this experience of evil and suffering, to try to find a way of making sense of the biblical narrative, this is the reason why I put together this Problem of Evil series. And as this has been chronological going through time in history in the Christian tradition, I have obviously then, just by sheer default, spent a lot more time exploring the different nuances of what we might call classical theism, you know, the various classical defenses, whether it's Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, even a natural theologian like a Gottfried Leibniz. So that has just by the sheer nature of history gotten the bulk of the time. Now we've spent a few episodes exploring some of the more novel theodicies um, of the 20th century that emerged in the 20th century. For both of you, neither, I should say, neither of you fall into the classical school of Christian thought. You, you are not big fans of at least some tenets, if not many of the tenets of, of classical theism, especially when it comes to theodicy. What did each of you find intellectually and emotionally unsatisfactory with the more classic theodicies? I'll start with you, Tom. Yeah, I'm a huge critic of classical theism. And let me define what I mean by classical theism so that our listeners can have an idea of what I'm uh, rejecting. Um, I, by classical me- theism, I don't mean the dominant views of God we find in the Bible. I think the dominant views of God in the Bible are different from what we find in classical theism. Some of the attributes of God that uh, we think of as part of classical theism are the idea that God is in all respects unchanging. If that's the case, then God can't have a change of mind like the scripture says God sometimes has. Another attribute is that God is impassable or unrelated, which means that God would not be affected by anything we do, good or bad. A third uh, classic view of God is that God is timeless. There's no future nor past for God. Somehow God exists beyond all time. I reject that view in part because of the way God is described in the Bible, but for other reasons as well. And finally, um, the classic view of omnipotence is really uh, various forms, but it basically says God has the kind of power that if God wants to, God could control anyone or anything in any situation. Now, some views of that says that God mostly doesn't control, but will occasionally step in and do something. Others had a very deterministic God who's controlling absolutely everything. But the idea of omnipotence uh, in that sense, I reject strongly. But I think the number one problem I have with classical theism is not those four, as important as those are. The number one problem I have is that it fails to take God's love as its starting point, as central. The the love revealed in Jesus Christ, the love expressed amongst the saints, the love to which we're all called to, not starting with divine love, I think 
leads theologies in all kinds of bad directions. And as evidence for that, let me, uh, let me point out, I have my head in the Apostles' Creed right now because Troopful and I are doing a, an eight-week online course in that. I read through the Apostles' Creed sometime. Not one mention of God's love, grace, compassion, care. You go through the other five major classic creeds from the councils. No mention of God's grace or love there. Um, for me, that's at the heart of everything. So not even mentioning it or starting with it creates all kinds of problems. And that's my big criticism of classical theism. Greg, you said you went through all sorts of different theodicies before uh, landing in the open view. What was it about some of these other classical theodicies that you found intellectually or emotionally unsatisfactory? Well, let me just say that uh, for whatever differences we have on this point, Tom and I are uh, two peas in a pot. I mean, it, it's because uh, I, I also have little patience for classical theism. Um, and, and you didn't mention it, 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 aseity, God's, you know, pure actuality, actus purus. He's got no potential. Uh, it's fully actualized. Oh, it's, it's, uh, but in, in terms of theodicy, the, the, I think it comes down to this. First, I would say that I think when we're talking about evil, it's always important to get concrete because I believe evil is always concrete. One of the uh, things that I think got uh, theology astray, starting with Augustine, actually a little, little before him, but it's the definite, it's, it's the old Platonic definition of evil as the absence of good. Uh, it, you know, that's an abstract definition. Um, but you see, if you're looking at an atrocity, so in God at War, I talk about Zosia, this young Jewish girl who had her eyes plucked out during one of the uh, roundups from the Warsaw Ghetto, and. Um, uh, it, it, to look at this young girl in this nightmare situation, getting her eyes plucked out as her mother's going insane, having to watch this, two guards just plucking out this little girl's eyes. Um, I, I wouldn't describe that as the absence of good. Oh, look at the absence of good there. There's something more <laughs> concrete there. There's something actual evil there. It's when an agent chooses, you, you could abstractly define evil as the absence of good, but it's when a, 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 an, in, an individual chooses that, that's what makes it evil. It's only a possibility before that. Or take uh, Bart's uh, concept of das nichtiga, the nothing. Um, okay, that's, you know, that, evil is that which God says no to when God says yes to creation. But Bart talks about das nichtiga as though it does something. But the nothing does nothing until an agent chooses it. And now it's concrete. So, so if you think about evil concretely, uh, the, the aspect of classical theology that most, I, I find most implausible is that when I look at, Zosha, I think about Zosha, or choose whatever nightmare you want to choose, but something that's really ghastly. Um, to think that God is choosing this, or at least choosing not to prevent it when God could otherwise have prevented it. Like in classical theism, there has to be a specific divine reason for every specific thing that happens, because at the very least, if you think God has the power to, uh, to just prevent it, well, if God didn't prevent it, it must be good that it happened, uh, since everything God does is good. Um, and so you have to, in the end, say that somehow it's good, it's Zosha, that Zosha had her eyes plucked out. Somehow it's good that just the, that number of children were gassed in Auschwitz and Dachau and other gas chambers. And like, it would be a tragedy if one less got gassed, because uh, you know, God knows the exact right number for kids to get gassed, and he, want, he allows or ordains to set number. I find that to be, uh, A, unbiblical, uh, because in the Bible, people really do thwart God's will. Uh, but B, it's just insulting. It, it, it's like you're not appreciating the depth of evil if you think that it's a, 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 it somehow contributes to the good of the whole. And Augustine says this explicitly in Confessions. He says, for you, God, there is no evil, because nothing could possibly thwart your will. Uh, and, and, and so evil is always perspectival. It, it's because of our limited, we just don't see the big picture. Uh, and I find, and he uses an analogy of the mosaic or, a, you know, a painting it has to have light strokes and dark strokes and all of those things. And together it's all beautiful. But if you look at one segment of the painting up too close, for example, well, then, you know, then you'll see it as evil. But the trouble is people are not paint pigment. Uh, and, and you, you listen to the, any good is appeal to the beauty of the universe when there's this child here and this mother here who are suffering this intolerable kind of pain. So I think that is the, 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 weak, the weakest link in the classical theology is that there has to be a specific good reason for everything that happens. Hmm. By the way, if you don't like Augustine's answer there, 
If you still have questions, Augustine says, God's got a hot place prepared for you if you keep asking those questions. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 well, what was God doing before he created the world? Well, preparing a place for hell for people to ask. <laughs> That's mm. right. Any so is it fair to say that for both of you, um, you are deeply concerned about the possibility that classical theodicies, classical theisms import a metaphysics onto the scripture that confines and constrains the scripture and constrains the biblical revelation? Is it fair to say that you guys are, are looking to build from your reading of scripture a, a metaphysics that supports the revelation? Who do you want to answer this? Either one, of, either one of you guys can jump in. Yeah. I think we're both pretty committed to the centrality of Scripture, but I'll speak for myself and say it's not just the Bible. It's also our common experiences and our moral intuitions. It's also some of the things we learn from uh, science and contemporary philosophy. So um, I don't want to say it all comes down to just the Bible. I think there's a variety of sources. I champion what the Bible says about God, especially as revealed in Jesus Christ, but it's not just the Bible. But even when you make a methodological decision, like I'm going to use scripture as my starting point or something like that, there's always personal experience and intuitions right. and things that you bring to it, and there's no way around that. But the way I, I, I put it in, in my book, Satan and the Problem of Evil, is that my theodicy, I, I'm trying to, given that their scripture has this warfare worldview, that, as I call it, uh, given that, what else must be true to make sense out of this? And so I end up with six theses that I think if these are true, then, then the puzzling nature of, uh, of, of evil in our experience and the Bible uh, can be made sense out of. Hmm. Uh, so I, I'm trying to yeah, construct a metaphysics that's based in principle on scripture, uh, but but there are all the other considerations. Like the way I read scripture, I, I I think the New Testament tells us that we should read it through the lens of Jesus Christ. That it's not a flat book; it's a storyline that's pointing in one direction, and it culminates in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, like when, when when Tom says he wants to start with love, all of our thinking about God should start with love. I totally agree with that. I just go further and and say you know, First John three sixteen tells us that here's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, so also we should lay down our life for one another. So that, to me, is, is my starting point. And given that, given that that's true, given that this world is screwed up the way it is, well, what must be true? What story must we tell to make sense out of this scripture and out of our, this experience that we're in? Yeah, I think that's just to give you guys a defense, and I'm not trying to make an apologetic for either one of your viewpoints, but one thing I commonly hear are charges of maybe— and, not that you guys have ever heard this, charges of heresy <laughs> railed against you guys. I'm sure you've never heard anything like that. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. I, I live in the Twin Cities here too, Greg, and I don't think I've ever heard that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You need to learn sign language. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's, I wanted to highlight that because I, I think this is important for people to see when we have good faith conversations with people that sometimes these caricatures that people have painted – about you guys are, are, are not grounded in the reality of what your intentions are, that you guys, we all start with some sort of hermeneutic key, right? That we read the scriptures through and interpret reality. And it, it seems like to me that both of you guys are w with full, full, well, good intentions, trying to shape a theodicy around these core convictions that you believe are really, really biblical. Greg, I'm curious, I want to start with you here. And we get into maybe some of the, the particulars of your viewpoint, uh, people, that have listened to this podcast regularly have already gone through, hopefully they've gone through part 16 uh, in this series on open theism. So they should have a basic grasp of the open view. But I also mentioned there that there are different emphases. There's nuances among open theists. So I'm curious, uh, what are maybe for you in your particular brand of open theism or the open view of the future, what do you see as the core tenets or, or fundamental affirmations of the open view? Sure. Well, um, it, I think it really comes down to just this. Uh, I think that uh, God creates, uh, grants agents, at least humans. Uh, we could talk about angels, perhaps, and perhaps subhuman uh, creatures have a degree of freedom. But I'll stick with just with humans because it's simpler that way. But he grants us a degree of freedom. Uh, and I think that entails then that we have the power to choose this or choose that. 
we, we have it's called libertarian free will. Uh, and since we have the power to choose this or that, what is real prior to our resolving which one we're going to choose, what's real are possibilities. We might choose this or we might choose that. So in deciding to create a world uh, and populating it with free agents, God has decided to create a cosmos in which the future is to some degree composed of possibilities. And that's the open view. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, some open theists, uh, early on especially, Clark Panic and, and some others, uh, spoke about it as limiting God's omniscience. Uh, like God voluntarily chooses. Dallas Willard does the same thing as well. He chooses to, to, to not know a future, which always strikes me as, how do you choose not to know something? <laughs> he doesn't know it to know that you're not supposed to know it. And even if you <laughs> chose not to know it, what good does it do us? If the future is exhaustively settled, uh, then I, I don't see how we have free will, whether God knows it or not. So God's ignorance wouldn't do us any good. I, I think God genuinely creates possibilities and so knows the future that's comprised of possibilities. Um, and then uh, I also add that, that it's, I think, part of the, in giving you free will to go this way or that way, that means that God has to have a, uh, a covenant of non-coercion, I call it, in, in saying the problem of evil. Uh, God can't unilaterally control what you do if, in fact, God's given you the power to do that. Uh, or if God were to revoke your freedom because he didn't like the choices you were going to make, well, that would just mean that he, God didn't, didn't actually give you the possibility of going this way or that way. So I think when God creates a free agent, there is a domain of possible uh, storylines that that agent could go down. And God doesn't determine uh, which storyline that the agent chooses. The only, only other thing I'd say about that is that I think God being infinitely intelligent, if you grant that God's got no limit to God's intelligence, then God can anticipate each and every one of a trillion, trillion to the trillionth power possibilities as though each and every one of those possibilities were, were a certainty. Um, God doesn't lose anticipatory power by virtue of the number of possibilities God has to anticipate because you can't fraction up infinity and God has got infinite intelligence. So whatever comes to pass, I believe I can say as robustly as a classical theologian could say that God has a plan as to how to bring good out of evil out of this situation here. He's had that plan in place from the from the founding from before the world began, because it was possible before the world began, that the world might unfold just this way, could have gone a trillion, trillion to the twinth power in other ways, but it went this way. And God, from the beginning of creation, has been setting up a response to it to bring good out of it. Uh, so the only difference between my view and, say, the classical Arminian view, where God foreknows what you're going to do, is that I think my God's infinitely smarter. Because the classical view knows one storyline. God's got a crystal ball and can look into it and see what's going to happen. I think the real situation is God looks at the, all the possibilities of how this universe could unfold, how each life could unfold, how each molecule could act, and, and anticipates that, like a, a chess champion who anticipates your every move from the beginning of the game. He's assured to win because she is smarter. Uh, and I think that's why the Bible praises God's wisdom in running creation at least as much as it praises God's power. So that's my summation of the open view. That's really helpful. So just to clarify, between your open view, Greg, and maybe someone like a Clark Pinnock again, there were some very early on, especially maybe in that 19, that seminal book that came out in 1994, which probably kind of first launched in academia and evangelical right, right. circles, the controversy, that for some, some open theists, that, that God had, uh, it was just, it was an act of self-limitation to not know contingent possibilities. But what you're saying is more on the ontological level right. in the way that God structured and chose to structure reality contained not just actualities that are definitively known, but possibilities, contingent possibilities that don't become actualities until free agents choose them. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's 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 a helpful clarification, I think, for people. And then those of you listening, and maybe you're already coming up with, oh, I got objections to this. We'll get to a, a section of objections later in the conversation, and and bring up some maybe some common challenges. What about for you, Tom? Well, I add, yeah. Add one, one point is, is yeah. this: that in some ways, it, it's not you know, it, it's understandable that open theists, especially early on, but we still have this variation I'm talking. But part of the problem we're up against is that the Western tradition has always had. Uh, a prejudice toward determinism. And, and in our very language about the future, it almost, like we say, Christmas is approaching, as though Christmas was out there and it's coming towards us. Or uh, we're coming close to your birthday, as though your birthday is out there and we're approaching it. Um, so we, the metaphors we use to talk about time 
are actually tend towards determinism. I think it goes back to ancient Greek philosophy with Aristotle's square of opposition uh, that it, it was prejudiced towards determinism. So sometimes open theists talk about how God can't know the future. Well, they're presupposing a settled view of the future in saying that God can't know it. If the future was settled, all the facts of what's going to happen are out there. Well, then it would be, you'd have to say, well, I, I just, God can't know truth. And like William Hasker holds this view. Like, there are some truths that just can't be known. I think that, that omniscience means that God knows all truths. Um, it's just that part of the truths of what God knows is that some things are possibly this and possibly that. And that's the final thing to be said about it. But uh, yeah, so it, it's hard to carve out a whole new way of talking about the future. Uh, and that's kind of what we're up to here. Uh, but we're going against the whole tradition in doing it. So you're really kind of taking a crowbar and saying, hey, underneath what you assume is just this is the Bible. What you're saying are some there's some pre philosophical presuppositions that we've assumed are just part of the biblical narrative. They've been and imported. Cultural and cultural things. Yeah. goes into reading all this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and this is where you have to let every. Scripture push back on on what is even things that are natural to your enculturation, like the way that you speak about the future. So mm. I, I think God that God does know the future. It's just that the future isn't exhaustively settled. God mm. knows the future exactly as it is now, and as it is now, I think is partly settled but partly open to the degree that agents have free will. To that degree, I think the future is comprised of possibilities, not settled facts. Okay. Tom, Can I add a, a quick yeah, go for point it. of clarification there for our listeners? Because I agree with everything Greg said, but I um, I wanted to note that Bill Hasker, William Hasker, doesn't say God is self-limited and chooses not to go to the, right. you know, the future. I think the best example of that position, a position I also reject, is Dallas Willard rather than Clark Pinnock. Clark changed his mind on so many things over the years, <laughs> which was a virtue in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah. But uh, Dallas wrote a very... Uh, philosophical paper defending that view and it's one i also reject i don't think there is a future to be known so god can't self-limit to not know it well i'm glad you add that that point in um even especially the one the sub point that you just made tom about uh this idea that changing our mind is seen as being a deficiency of character or something like that um and instead if a guy like Clark Pinnock or any one of us, that we would remain open, always open to the possibility that the truth transcends us and where we're currently at, and we should remain open to the possibility we might have things wrong. I mean, that's at the heart no. of repentance, right? Yeah. So, Tom, Tom, everybody uh, else has it wrong. Greg yeah. and I have it perfectly right. <laughs> well, Tom, I'm not sure about you, but I'm, I, I know I do. <laughs> Tom, uh, unfortunately, Tom, I. Uh, you know, while I did a, a full episode on open theism, I haven't done a specific episode in advance of this on your essential kenosis view, but I, I have covered process theism. Is it fair to say that your essential kenosis view, your or your, you know, sometimes just called the, the God can't theodicy, is that a nuanced variation of process theism? Is that um, something entirely different? Help us understand where there might be points of similarity and difference from process theism? Yeah, it's a really fair question. And it's always hard to answer it because it kind of presupposes there is a agreed upon definition of what process theology is. Uh, and yet someone like John Cobb, who's probably the foremost uh, process theologian alive today at 94 years old, he says there is no essence or there is no core to process theology. His uh, probably most influential student, David Ray Griffin, he's got 10 core doctrines of process theology. So it's hard for me to kind of gauge what whether my view is process theology or not. Some process theologians reject my view, others like it. I just have come to the place where I like to talk about a broad umbrella that I call open and relational thought under which my essential kenosis view fits, openness, various forms of openness fit, various forms of process fit, some feminist, some relational, there's all kinds of things under that umbrella. And then kind of try to be specific about my own particular brand or view in that. And essential kenosis says that love comes logically first in God's nature, such that God must love all creation. That love is self-giving and others empowering and therefore inherently or essentially uncontrolling. God can't control anyone or anything. 
This love is the kind of love that gives freedom to complex creatures like you and me and maybe dolphins and chimps and our dogs. It gives agency to simpler creatures like maybe cells and worms. It gives uh, self-organization to even simpler entities and even the power to exist to the most fundamental elements of reality. And because this, this gift to all creation, depending on how complex it is, comes from God's very nature of love, and God can't deny God's self, to use the Pauline language, God must give this to creation, which means that God essentially cannot control anyone or anything at any time. God is a necessary cause, always an influence. God's not off on you know, Mars watching us from a distance, but God is never the sole cause or the controlling factor in any situa situation. And I suspect your listeners can see the implications that has for the problem of evil. We can't blame God for either causing or even allowing evil because this God can't cause or allow evil. Hmm. Seems like at least one point of similar concern to some of the process theists that we explored in episode 15 was the sense in which you were concerned about this idea that God can coerce, use coercion to bring about certain outcomes. Is that because you see coercion as being antithetical to the nature of love? Um, yes, although, you know, I don't really like to use that word coercion because I've discovered over the years it has so many different meanings that I oftentimes talk past my, my listeners. So I like to use words like single-handed, which gives the impression that God is the sole cause. Um, maybe one way to describe my view uh, compared with at least some process theologians and at least some openness, I'll call them evangelical openness theologians, is to say that some evangelical openness folks think that God is voluntarily self-limited, either when creating the world or moment by moment in the here and now. And because God is voluntarily self-limited, God could decide to become unlimited sometime, maybe to fiddle with the laws of nature or do a miracle among the cancerous cells or even override free will if really necessary, but God usually doesn't. I reject that view because then you start to wonder why God doesn't do that kind of uh, single-handed control more often to prevent the evils of the world. On the other side of my view are those uh, ideas that say that somehow God is externally limited. God is limited by Satan or principalities and powers or metaphysical laws or the God-world relationship or um, creativity itself, to use Whitehead's language. All that language sounds like there's something outside of God, and God is like, oh, man, I'd really like to do something here, but that thing is stopping me. My view sits, I think, kind of between those two. <laughs> and it says that God's own nature decides what God can and can't do. And God's nature is first and foremost love. So God must love. God can't choose not to love. And part of that means that God can't control anyone or anything. Hmm. Now, obviously, you guys have volumes of books dedicated to exploring <laughs> your theodicies. So I thought maybe one of the things that might be most beneficial with the time that we have is to, to go through kind of as a way of exploring some of the common problems, questions that regularly come up as people attempt to formulate a theodicy is to maybe explore how you two might respond uniquely to some problems or challenges that I'm going to present. I'm, so what I'd like to do is just present some statements. These statements might re represent ideas that differing Christian theologians and philosophers, or even just lay people in the church might hold to. And then I'd like you to tell me, we'll just take turns on this. I'd like you to tell me whether you agree or disagree with the statement and maybe give some explanation as to why you would be in agreement or disagreement with it. Does that sound good to you guys? Sure. Awesome. Okay. For it. All right. So here's the first statement. All right. Some like Aquinas or even the natural theologian Gottfried Leibniz argued that it's a logical necessity for there to be a distinction between creator and creation. And because God is the perfection of truth, goodness, and beauty, that creation could not have been made as the perfection of truth, goodness, and beauty. So in other words, God cannot make God, right? If we were to imagine 
the perfection of truth, goodness, and beauty, if we were to imagine a world free of all suffering or deficiency, they argue, especially Leibniz argues, you would be conceiving of God and God can't make God. Therefore, some degree of what we might call a metaphysical deficiency is necessary in creation. Leibniz called this the metaphysical, the, 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 the logical necessity for metaphysical evil. Do you guys agree or disagree with this concept? I'll, I'll start with you, Greg. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, well, it depends on how, 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 how you flesh this all out. That, that view actually uh, goes back at least to Plato, uh, where the idea of you know the, the eternal is that which is unchanging and perfect, and then you have a scale of being. And the farther down the scale of being, the hierarchy of being you go, the more the more contingent and the more susceptible to evil you are. Uh, things like that. And then that, that, that really gets, comes before in Neoplatonism, which then makes inroads into the Christian tradition through Gregory and Nyssa and some others. Gregory and Nyssa actually held the view that, and, and you could argue this of origin as well, that, that the creation and fall are synonymous. They're, they're identical. To be created is to be fallen because of this metaphysical thing. The thing is that I, I would agree, agree that there's a, the creator-creation distinction is very important. Uh, God alone is eternal uh, and, and has a necessary nature and all those other things. Um, but I, I, so I'd agree that being created uh, is you, you can't create God. You can't, you can't create a co-eternal being because <laughs> that presupposes temporality. But um, it seems to me that there is a perfect way for a contingent created being to be uh, an imperfect way of it, of it to be. You can't be perfect like God is, but you could be perfect. It, you know, what, what, what would a perfect orangutan look like or a peach or whatever, but you can be perfect in your own right. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so I, I don't think creating beings, especially with free will, creates the possibility of evil. And in that sense, we're not like God. God is, I think I agree with Tom, God has a necessary nature uh, and, and is he's not contingently holy, he's necessarily holy. Um, so being created gives your contingent being, you could be otherwise, which means there's a possibility you could go down an evil route. But to be that being is not itself evil. It's, it's a good. It's, to be, have been created is good. It just has the potential for evil. So I don't think, I, I don't think you get very far uh, with a theodicy on, just on the basis of a creator-creation distinction. Plus, it seems to me that the way the Bible talks about this creation is that it is fallen. Something's gone wrong. Uh, it, it's not just that it's created that's bad. Paul says that the whole creation was subject to futility and frustration, Romans 8. So, so I have other reasons for thinking that more than just being created is going on uh, when we talk about the problem of evil. Tom, what about you? Do you agree with this sort of concept? Greg says yeah. it can be traced back to Plato. Uh, we see it a lot, and you know, Leibniz might make the most distinct and clear phrase that he calls metaphysical evil. Do you agree or disagree with him on that? I think Leibniz is right that God can't create another God. Greg, Greg and I agree on that. Um, I think also Leibniz is right that there's a real distinction between creation and the creator. That's why I'm not a pantheist, for instance. Um, I think the way I would couch it out, and it's very similar to what Greg said, I would say God is the only being whose nature is necessarily loving. God has freedom in how to love, but God doesn't have freedom whether or not to love. But creatures, we don't have natures of necessary love. We have freedom. So it is metaphysically necessary that we have the possibility to choose good and evil, especially among complex creatures. I would argue even amongst simpler creatures, but we can you know, hash the details out there. So that's a metaphysical necessity for the possibility, but it's not metaphysically necessary that creatures be evil. Things could have gone another way, and I and I think Greg have the hope that in the future some things will, all things will ultimately be redeemed and go and cooperate with God. Okay, there are some next statement here. These are helpful. Hopefully, listeners are finding them helpful. There are some experiences of suffering that should not be understood as evil, but instead should be thought of like. Bart's shadow side of God's will. So not Das Nistige, which uh, Greg brought up earlier, This uh, the, where Bart pointed to something that really truly was an evil presence, but Bart also thought that there may be something called the shadow side of God's will in creation. So for example, entropy in the universe, decay, the breaking down of our bodies, even for someone like Bart, physical death need not be thought of as evil. Bart's 
instead should be thought of as just the shadow side of God's will in creation, that this is part of the way God chose creation to function. Do you agree or disagree? I'll start with you, Tom, on this one. I'm no fan of Karl Barth, especially (laughs) when it comes to these kinds of issues. Um, I don't think that everything that involves pain, everything that involves death is genuinely evil. I define a genuine evil as any event that all things considered make the world worse than it might have otherwise have been had some other possible event occurred, kind of a philosophical definition there. But it's a way of saying that there are genuine evils that happen in the world, but not everything that hurts is genuinely evil. But what I especially object to is this idea that God has a shadow side. It presupposes something, a tension in Bart's theology Bart wanted to make the claim that love is essential to God's nature. And you can spin out all kinds of theologies that sound pretty close to the one that I've been proposing when you start there. But he also had this fundamental claim that God's freedom is also at the center of God's nature. And that freedom then, I think, makes him susceptible to all kinds of worries about God being able to control others or create a world a very different kind of way if God had wanted to. It it sets one up to think that God, at least at the beginning, and if not now, has this kind of unlimited power to do what God wants to do because God is unlimited, unlimited in freedom. So instead of talking about a, a dark side of reality or God's shadow side, I think we should say that um, not everything is evil, but some things are evil. And we should ask the question, why doesn't God prevent the genuinely evil events of the world. And of course, Greg and I have answers to that. Greg, what are your thoughts? Um, and here's one area where I think Tom and I uh, have a fundamental disagreement where um, I, I don't like, I, I, I feel about Bart the way I feel about Luther. Um, oh boy. <laughs> I, I love him when I love him and I can't stand him when I can't stand him. I mean, he, he, it was, he has all right intuitions, but he's boxed in by some of his reformed tradition and and then he uses phrases that I think are just unintelligible, like God determines us in our self-determination. What the heck? What does that mean? <laughs> God determines us. <laughs> Anyways, it's the kind of nonsense that only theologians are capable of, I guess. But uh, I, 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 would, I, I think entropy, uh, the thing is, is like, it's easy for us to describe the way the creation is. It's much harder for us to, to imagine how it could have been otherwise. But I have reasons to think it could have been otherwise than it is, uh, including things like death. According to the New Testament, Satan is the Lord of death, Hebrews 2.14. And Jesus came down to earth to destroy the one who has the power of death, uh, that is the devil, which tells me that death wasn't originally part of God's plan, at least not death as we experience it now. We can talk about how it could have gone otherwise, but I see that. Or why do things have to run down? According to the scientific account of creation, everything tends towards randomness, second law, thermodynamics, entropy, all that. And it's going to supposedly end up a, 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 a total state of equilibrium, a heat death. Uh, it sums with nothingness. Uh, but why Why does creation have to, like, well, is, is there is there a, a metaphysical reason why things couldn't get better and better and better? And keep on, and wouldn't that be more consistent with the, the, the creator, the kind of God who created this? Why do things have to break down? Why do our bodies have to get old and fat and achy and fall apart and then we finally die? I, I don't think it was supposed to go this way. I mean, that, that's where I go back to Romans 8. Paul says that the entire creation groans is subject to futility now to explain that then you have to say well why would god let that happen and 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 here again i think is where tom and i disagree i would apply the free will defense not just to human beings but also to angelic beings and in the end in the end i would say that everything in creation that is contrary to the character of god comes from a will or wills other than god Uh, and and so i think there are agents out there that have corrupted the good creation and uh, that's why we now have, you know, it, it, I think Jesus' whole ministry confirms this. He's always, when he confronts sicknesses, disease, deformities, blindness, or whatever, those are just natural evils. Uh, and yet he declares them, and the gospel authors declare them as being of the devil. They're, they're demonic. And he, he manifests the character of God by coming against them and freeing the people from these afflictions. In fact, the word that's sometimes used for afflictions in the gospels is mystics. Uh, and it literally means flogging. Um, and, and so they, they have this conception that, 
that, that when a person's suffering, when, when eyes aren't working the way eyes are supposed to work or uh, legs aren't working the way legs are supposed to work or whatever, that, that is, these people are, are, are victims. They're being flogged. They're being whipped by, by the enemy. Uh, Acts 10, 38, Peter says that, you know, God's hand was on Jesus. He went around doing good, freeing people uh, from the devil's oppression by healing them. And so I, I, I view that this world is demonically oppressed, and that's why we have the, the natural evils that we have. Well, that's a great segue into the next statement or question for both of you. Uh, here's the next statement. The long, bloody history of evolution and the several extinction-level events that happened in the Earth's past were all part of the way God planned for creation to unfold. Agree or disagree? Um, let's start with you on this one, Greg. Well, I, 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 I disagree. In fact, Tom and I were in a, a three-week conference about, what was it, 10, 15 years ago, uh, out yeah. on the East Coast, and we were talking about open theology and, and problem of evil, whatever, and out of that came uh, two edited books. Tom, Tom edited these books. And I wrote a, a, my essay in, in uh, the book called Creations, uh, Creation Made Free, I think it's called, um, is, is evolution as, as spiritual warfare or as cosmic conflict. Uh, and what I propose is just based on the, the pattern of Jesus' ministry and what we find you know, throughout the, the, the Bible about this world being in a, in a, caught in, a, in, in this crossfire of this cosmic battle, I propose that we, we see evolution as a, a spiritual warfare of God creating, uh, but then the principles and powers discreating, but then God bringing good out of evil by furthering evolution, but then the enemy discreates. And um, um, yeah, so you see good throughout the evolutionary process, it's process, but you also see a whole lot of nasty, nastiness. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why Darwin lost his faith is he said there, there sometimes seems to be a sort of an, an intelligence in, the, in, in, in nature, but it, it's, it's demonic. Um, it, you know, the, he, he was fascinated by the ecumenidae uh, insect that can bur- it plants its lar- larvae in caterpillars and the, caterp- the, the larvae then eat the caterpillar from the inside out over a period of two weeks, knowing exactly which organs not to digest to keep the thing alive while they, 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 they uh, devour it. And he looked at that and says, if, if there's a mind behind this, it, then uh, it, it's, it's a demonic mind. But if you want a fun YouTube uh, rabbit trail, just just YouTube search "ignore me and wasps," and there are those videos are horrific. Oh, really? I haven't to seen watch. them. I got to pick those out. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about problem of evil <laughs> in nature on display well, right it, there. There's a book I have right over here. Uh, it's called "Dark Nature," written by just a naturalist anthropologist. But he just explores kind of a, the horrendous side of nature, and to, and he does it to try to understand how human beings are capable of all this evil. Uh, it, it, but it's some of the accounts of what chimpanzees can do to each other. And is, oh man, this is... So to clarify, Greg, you would be open to the possibility that, say, the extinction level event that happened 64 million years ago, 65 million years ago, that got rid of the dinosaurs, that made it possible for mammals and for humans to even occupy a space on the planet, that that could have all been spiritual warfare? Well, I, 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 I really am hesitant to say that this comment or this, that tornado or this right, sort of right. thing, well, the devil was designing it. Yeah. But I, I see the corruption of, though the early church all held that view. I mean, it, it, this was a uniform thing up until the third, fourth century, where when they talked about famines and you know natural evil, they instinctively attributed that to demons and to the devil. They, they, they didn't do this mysterious will of God thing at all. No, this is warfare. Um, but I, I would say that if it wasn't for the corruption of the powers— um, principalities and powers, we wouldn't have this kind of these kind of disasters, the, the extinction creating events and things like that. Um, but God's always at work to He anticipates every possibility and has a plan in place to bring some good out of evil, uh, whatever comes uh, our way. Tom, do you agree with Greg on this? Uh, or I should maybe rephrase that. Do you agree with the statement that the long bloody history of evolution and these extinction level events were were part of the way God planned for creation to unfold? Saying God planned sounds like God started from a blank slate. One of the differences between Greg and I is I go with the Bible and I don't believe in creation out of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it that way, Greg. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> so uh, I don't think God once existed in isolation and then for whatever reason said, hey, I think I'm going to create a universe. I think God has always been creating. So that means there are forces and factors God creates alongside. I therefore think it's quite likely, maybe even necessary, but at least quite likely that there was going to be a bloody evolutionary history. But again, for me, uh, bloody doesn't necessarily mean evil. 
I suspect these um, um, uh, evolutionary dead ends are evil, genuinely evil, not what God wanted, but just death and the blood that oftentimes accompanies that amongst complex creatures um, isn't necessarily evil. I th- I'm neutral or agnostic on Greg's warfare thesis. I mean, I guess in the general sense, I'm in favor of the warfare in the sense that there's good and evil and there's forces in play. But in terms of there being demons and the devil, my theology is neutral or agnostic on that. If there happens to be demons, then I attribute them, at least some of what they do, as some of the negative forces and influences in creation. If there's not, then I think I can account for the natural evils and other kinds of evils without appealing to demonic agents. Um, I think, and I'd love to hear Greg's thought on this. We we talked a little bit about the past, but I've been thinking more about it, Greg. At least for me, I can't make good sense of the demonic warfare thesis as demons being the cause of at least some natural evils if one doesn't also embrace some form of panpsychism, that is the idea that all the units of reality have some kind of responsiveness, maybe even mentality. Um, The reason I say that is when I think about demonic oppression amongst humans, I almost always think of it as mental. And then I assume that a person's body might contort or do weird things because the person themselves is in, let's say, cahoots or cooperation. Um, I have a hard time uh, thinking that a demon could, let's say, um, manipulate the pandemic, a coronavirus. COVID-19. So are you looking? Are you looking for like a mechanism that would connect these spiritual entities to material functions in the Something world? Something like that. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry, I'm kind of going long. Sorry, Paul. No, that's that's yeah. a great question. That's a great question. I mean, I'd love to hear Greg's response on that. Well, I, yeah, I don't know the mechanism. Um, but I don't think that is too much of a detriment to my position because I don't know the mechanism for what I'm doing right now, talking to you. I, 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 how's my spirit interacting? I have reasons to think that I'm more than just physicality here. Uh, I have a mind, I have consciousness, I have free will, but I can't, I don't know the mechanism. We don't know what consciousness, how consciousness comes about. Is it epiphenomenal? Is it, you know, so uh, I, I don't, I don't know the mechanism, how, how they are able to corrupt or whatever, but I can draw analogies like you know, human beings. We we are able to manipulate nature. We have we breed dogs. We create different kinds of. You know, we direct evolution, uh, and 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 so if we do it, I don't I don't know why they, if there are agents that are invisible to us, uh, but have a, a more say so than us, have cosmic influence. I could uh, imagine them uh, corrupting it in, in various ways. Tom, were you saying just to, I want to clarify for listeners that uh, an important point you made from the outset that in not. You don't see creation ex nihilo as the the biblical affirmation, which listeners of the podcast are. That's not a new, th- you know. We've talked about that concept in other okay, theologians in the past. But for you, would you say then that uh, creation is uh, somehow also necessary, metaphysically, ontologically necessary, alongside God? Who uh, so is the relationship between creator and creation not in one in which creation is contingent? on the creator, but is also metaphysically necessary. Yeah. Uh, First, let me address the uh, biblical foundations for creation out of nothing. Uh, I don't think there's any passage in the Protestant New Testament or Protestant uh, canon that explicitly says God creates out of nothing. There is a second Maccabees passage in the other, you know, translations, but even that one, I don't think explicitly has a creation out of nothing. If you read the context, the nothing there is really a something. And you don't have to be like a liberal to think that. I mean, conservative biblical scholars like John Walton or uh, Bruce Waltke both think that creation out of nothing is not in the Bible. But if you throw that out, I think then you're presented with the question that you just asked of, does that make creation necessary or contingent? How do you think about that? And I think uh, that question's not been answered very well by those who reject creation out of nothing. And I've decided to try to propose an answer. And my answer says that uh, God always creates in each moment out of that which God previously created and that creating has is everlasting. It's been ongoing. 
With no this first cause? No first cause, no first creation. God cre- creates in each moment out of that which God previously created, and there was no absolute beginning. This doesn't mean that our world or our universe, or if there's multi-universes, is necessary in and of themselves. They can each be contingent in the sense that they didn't have to be the way they are, but there has to be some kind of creaturely other. So that's necessary. So we might say the abstraction of some creaturely other is necessary, but the concrete creaturely other can be contingent, can vary from degree to degree. I've got some illustrations about that if you want to go that way, but that's a a quick answer. Well, I think if you have those uh, afforded in any of your books, we'll make sure to link that because I do want to cover a couple other topics in our time together to make sure we at least get a breadth of introduction to your guys' work and then people can go go deeper with your 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 books that are available as well. Maybe it's just a couple of other statements before we do uh, some Wait, objections. Can I ask one question before yeah. we see the next one? Mm-hmm. Uh, just, it was, so Tom, tell, tell if, if, God, if God's always been creating, and I don't deny the possibility of that. I'm with Aquinas on this. He, he, he didn't rule out that God could have eternally been creating. But the crucial thing he thought was, and I think, is that could God exist? It, could, could God be self-sufficient within God's self? Uh, that's the, 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 the crucial issue. It pertains on your, your view of God. But what I'm interested in here is, is if, if for all eternity God's been creating and, and this is the best we could do, uh, he could do, we together could do, how do you have any hope that it will get significantly better, let alone arrive at the kind of glorious ending that Paul tells us about that can't be compared to the sufferings of this present world? Yeah, well, my hope is that God continues to love and creation cooperates. If I had a view that said God could sometime in the future set aside uh, this persuasive love and kick some butts and (laughs) single-handedly bring about some conclusion, then I'd have all kinds of problems with the problem of evil, which Paul is, is having us address here. So I'm not attracted to your infinite possibilities and infinite number of uh, what do you call it? The infinite numbers of side or alternative options, reactions, and things. That's the infinite intelligence. Yeah, the infinite intelligence. I mean, I think God knows everything that's possible to know, but for me, that word "infinite" is a is a sticky word. It uh, doesn't describe things very well. Um, I don't think it. Well, it's not a positive statement in the usual sense of uh, a plenitude. It just simply means not finite. And I worry, in your view, if God has had these infinite possibilities and God's always going to squeeze something good out of what happens because God knows all the alternatives, then I wonder, well, do you really have genuinely evil events in the world if God knew that they were going to happen and has all the possibilities? I know you want to say God does, so I'm not accusing you that. But I just, it makes me wonder if these infinite possibilities are always on God's mind, then um, is anything that happens going to ever frustrate God's will. And you think God's will can be frustrated. You said that earlier. Sure. So, yeah. Is it fair to say, Greg, that your your question is really about if God's, if there was never an initial state of goodness, initial state where there could be the absence of deficiency, of suffering, of even metaphysical deficiency, if there was never an initial state, how can we have certain that God will ever bring about a final state in which those things are resolved? Is that your concern? Not, not only how can we be certain, but how is it possible? Uh, uh, it, it, if we could arrive at a final state, well, then it, we've had all eternity to do it, so wouldn't we be there already? Mm-hmm. It's that, that kind yeah. of a, a Yeah, question. it's possible in my scenario, but not certain. There's not a kind of guarantee. I think that guarantee can only come through, you know, divine coercion, the unilateral determination. It's possible because God can eventually persuade all of creation to cooperate. And I have a way of thinking about this that ends up uh, creatures can influence others for good. And uh, But it's not the kind of certainty that I think you want in your scenario, Greg, and it, at least some Christians want. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think... I think a lot of Christians want it. Uh, <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> I, I'm hanging my life on that one. It's like, and, and so the, the sure... I don't see how you can even say it's a possibility, but even if you could say it's a possibility, I, 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 I want more than that in terms of faith, uh, to, to believe that there will, there's a glory that, that's waiting that renders all the suffering of this present age incomparably worth it. Uh, that is so beautiful. 
that that's what gets me through is no, I, mean, it, it, I consider that a promise of God. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this it helps me. Uh, you know, I was reading John Wesley. Oh, I guess it was maybe a year ago or so. And he, he said something that helped me a lot. He said, uh, could God save the world in a single act? He says, yeah, I don't know. Wesley's not sure God can do that. But he says this, I know this, he saved me. And if he can save me, then who's to say he can't save others? In other words, if I cooperated with God, why be pessimistic that all creation is not going to be cooperating with God? So I think I have that kind of optimism of God's grace in that way. Wait, 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 wait. If we ever attain a final state, would that then be the end of God's creating? Well, I don't even think you think we attain a final state because don't you think we have dynamic freedom even in the afterlife? Yeah, but not, not, not freedom to sin. I, I would say that we have the freedom. We, oh, okay. we, we, we acquire the freedom to love like God loves, which is the highest form of freedom, which is loving without the possibility of not loving. Our, our characters get solidified. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I just... I agree that God, I don't think God's going to snap his fingers and all of a sudden it's going to be, you know, all okay. Sure. Because I yeah. agree with the participation thing. But is that by, Greg, because this is one of the questions I wanted to address. Is that by some intentional choosing on God's part or some limitation imposed upon God that he cannot, right in this moment, set everything right? Yeah. I think it's, it's God having decided to create this kind of world. I think God could have created other worlds, but there's always metaphysical prices that you have to pay. For example, if you're going to create a world where there's free agents, you're going to have to take the risk that things will go wrong. This is going to be evil. Uh, you, I think God could have created a world that we didn't have free will, or at least not morally significant free will. And it would have been a world that without any evil, but it also would have been a world without the value that comes with free will. And the most important of which is love. Uh, we, we can choose love. I think a coerced love or a pre-programmed love is not loving at all. Um, so, but given that God created this kind of world, given that he's already invested uh, agents with free will, God can't just decide to have it otherwise, because if he revoked the free will, he never really gave it. The very definition of free will, I think, it involves irrevocability. And so my, my irrevocable, my, my concept of freedom being irrevocable, inherently irrevocable, it, it, that's what covers the same mileage as uh, as what Tom wants to cover with his essential kenosis. Hmm. I, I think it's a logical contradiction. Everyone grants, even Aquinas, classical theologians grant that God can't do a logical contradiction because a logical contradiction has nothing to do. So in that sense, I think it's almost tautological to say that God can't revoke free will once he's given it. It's just that we're not used to thinking about it that way, so you have to spell it out, that it's a... Uh, uh, the logic of irrevocability is that God can't, God just can't intervene because uh, He gave these agents the free will to do this. So would that that pre would that require Greg that in order for God's final setting right of the world, the eschaton, for the kingdom to come, we need to get to a point in which people's characters have been so transformed by the Spirit, by Jesus, by the, the, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, right? So that we would get to a point that when we get into the age to come, all we would be doing is be choosing between varying good options with nothing in our character, because our character has become so Christ-like that we would not want to choose between a good and an evil thing. I, I think in the final state, if we're Christ-like, the idea of going against God's will of not loving, of sinning in any way, We'll have all the tempting force of like me being tempted to go out and skin a cat. But you know what? I, I it, 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 that grosses me out. I would never. I'm not tempted by that. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think we'll. And so then, how does a final judgment work into that? Because wouldn't I know you've had maybe you've changed in the past, but I know you've been a proponent of conditional mortality in the past, um, yeah. some form of annihilation. If there's a final judgment point, isn't God saying, hey, I gave you a chance with your free will, and, you know, here's the cutoff point. Wouldn't that logically entail that you'd have to allow people to continually have the option post-mortem or post-judgment day to eventually come to the point of choosing? Yeah, if, if, if it is possible for God to, if God could create beings who have uh, a limited potential for stupidity, uh, who... It, we're, it's guaranteed that sooner or later we'll all eventually get it. Uh, if God could create that being, I, that's, I think, how God would do it, because God wants all to be saved. 
I'm not sure that is a metaphysical possibility, however. Uh, it, it could be the case, and all the evidence that seems to me suggests that it is the case, that the longer we go down any road, the more it becomes, you know, our, our, our choices become habits, our habits become character, our character becomes our destiny. And uh, it could be, the, if God sees that a person is irrevocably hardened against him, uh, then I, I don't see the, the options are to let that agent go on existing, but in that case, it would be hell. Uh, to, to be in the presence of God in an unredeemed state, Luther said, is hell. Uh, it, 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 God's loving you, and you despise it. And so, so out of mercy, I think God lets people go. Uh, God doesn't have to annihilate them. That implies a, an action. I think if, if God's the one who's holding us in being, all God has to do is stop doing something, namely withdraw his, his, his upholding presence, and then we go, the wicked shall be as though they never were, Obadiah 16. Uh, so I hope universalism is true, but I also think the warnings in the Bible are there for reason, and that's what I preach. Uh, that there's this threat of forfeiting eternal life uh, that I think is, is real, and that's what I have to teach. Well, we could obviously spend hours talking about final judgment, universalism, annihilation, eternal conscious torment. We can't dovetail off into that right now. Another I'd podcast. like to, another podcast, and I'd love to do this again sometime with both of you again, even on different subjects. But uh, I'd really love to make sure that in the time that we have remaining, that a, a couple of objections that I'm aware of, that uh, you guys are probably aware of as well to your positions, that we have an opportunity to maybe bring those couple objections up uh, and to spend at least a a little bit of time with each of them, not much. You know, obviously, you're not going to be given a satisfactory answer for for all of these. You can write a book for each objection um, to give you guys an opportunity to maybe respond to some of those objections, so we can have clarifying insight. And then to conclude by just having you guys maybe share um, something that you would say, "I'm in agreement with Greg on this." Tom says, "I'm in agreement with Greg on this." We've heard some of this already. Tom, uh, Greg says, "I'm in agreement with Tom on this," and then maybe a point where you go, "This is where we can't see eye to eye." So, uh, the first objection, Tom, for you: um, if kenosis is not voluntary divine self-limitation, but as you argue, the self self-giving love of Jesus is logically necessary in God's eternal essence, does this make some sort of ideal or value like love? ontologically necessary and God's will a sort of contingent, uh, almost like a demiurge that's ontologically contingent on that canonic love. So is it inverting the sense in which God has freedom of the will, but instead God's will is in some sort of um, lesser contingent ontological state to this concept called love? And if that is the case— who or what established the very laws of nature that God can't interrupt to begin with? Is this sort of like almost like a, I know some people accuse you of being a deist, but I'm almost maybe more concerned with questions about whether or not this is more akin to like a Gnostic ontology, where the reason why there's deficiency in the world is because the God of love still, he can't act in the world because the world's been created through some sort of limiting process on God. So how would you maybe respond right. to that? Yeah, there's about six things, six ways I would respond yeah. to that. <laughs> Let me start by responding to the will versus love, which is uh, prior. Um, the quick answer is yes. God's love comes prior to God's will. God can't choose not to love. Um, love comes first. Um, it's an interesting question because you sent this earlier, the, at least this first one, the way you phrased it, um, because you kind of make it sound like, well, if the will is second, it's a demiurge, it's somehow secondary contingent in some way, and, and um, that kind of sounds like a bad thing. Um, let's reverse it. What if we said this? God's omnipotent will comes first. And love is secondary. So God can say, you know, this loving thing, it's been a good run, but from here on out, I ain't going to love anybody. You could, that would be possible if omnipotent will comes prior to love. Um, I'm willing to bite all the bullets that come with putting love first and God's sovereign will second. I still have God making choices in relation to how to love, so it's not like a determined God. But uh, it is true that God's sovereign will is understood logically as uh, somehow underneath uh, love. 
in terms of the laws of nature question, um, this is an idea I explored quite a bit in The Uncontrolling Love of God. And uh, I, I don't like the phrase laws of nature. I'm not the only one who doesn't like it. Amongst philosophers of science, there's, there are, uh, philosoph excuse me, philosophers of science, there are numbers who like to use language like law-like regularities rather than laws of nature. And part of the reason I don't like it is it sounds like God sort of starts and decides, you know, I'm going to create a world. And in this world, I'm going to put X, Y, and Z laws, and they're going to have to obtain in all circumstances, unless, of course, I want to fiddle with it, intervene every once in a while. Um, instead, I think we ought to think that the law-like regularities we see in the world are there because God's love is steadfast and consistent at all levels of creation. So that God's consistent level uh, action at the quantum level is creates these law-like regularities that we can end up trusting. And one of the advantages of that move is if we say it, that love is the source of these law-like regularities and that God can't not love, God must love, then we can overcome the big questions about, you know, well, why didn't God suspend the law of gravity and stop that rock from killing her? Well, the law of gravity isn't like a law that God can fiddle with. It's just the way that the law-like regularities emerge in a world in which God loves everyone and everything at all levels. Wouldn't that also entail, though, that we'd see less consistency in the nature of reality? You know, so we have these... Oh, so. So in math, in science, in physics, if, if the constraints of God's will, if God's will is constrained by, by love, if love comes logically, I don't want to say ontologically prior, maybe you feel comfortable saying that, I don't know if that's what you're saying, prior. metaphysically prior, right? And that, that's what leads to all of this, the possibility of evil. Um, wouldn't it be that if God couldn't bring about through his will other activities or other states of being in creation that we would we should have less certainty that the laws of physics uh work that there there would there would leave room maybe for more uh what's the word i'm looking for a variability more variability in the very fabric of reality if it's so undetermined right if it acts according to its own will or maybe even you know we we could get into panpsychism and cosmopsychism if sure. if these how are these regularities like gravity consistently working if god's will isn't the thing that's holding them in place well there's a number of factors let me just focus on the one i think is probably most pertinent here um the assumption I have is that the simpler entities of reality have fewer variables, fewer possibilities in any particular moment. Greg here is right now listening to me talk and his mind's going a thousand different directions of all these possibilities because as a complex creature, he could freely choose a bunch of different responses. If a worm is listening to me, there's not that many responses. If a quark, even fewer. So in a world of varying complexities and a world in which God's love is steadfast, it's not that unusual we would have so many uh, law-like regularities. Just like uh, there are more diver uh, divergences, differences amongst humans than there are amongst worms and amongst quarks, that's what you just expect given the nature of reality. Thank you for not identifying me with a worm or a quark. I appreciate it. <laughs> Luther <laughs> says you're a worm, but <laughs> let uh, me, uh, can I have yeah. one more response before? Yeah. Um, in your question, you ask something to the effect of God acting unilaterally in history. Um, and I think I've addressed some of that already, but um, the way you said it is a, a very common Length, uh, very common criticism of my view, and I and I want to try to clarify so maybe it will help. Um, yeah, that's great. I do think God acts unilaterally. So, like as a secondary cause, not just the primary cause. As primary cause, but I don't think God ever single-handedly determines outcomes. Let me give you an example. Thirty-two years ago. I took my girlfriend to a restaurant. I pulled out the ring. I said, will you marry me? I acted. 
Now, in order for us to be engaged, she had to say, yes, I will marry you. I couldn't determine that outcome single-handedly because love involves the participation of the other. So I think God is acting all the time unilaterally in the sense that no one's forcing God. But the question is, are there outcomes in the world that God can bring about single-handedly? And that's where I'm saying no. If God could, then we have the problem of evil problems, and I won't rehearse that. Um, you also, well, I'll just stop there. because Well, no, that's good. I could say. That's good. I, I, I do want to ask that just one follow-up question before I present one, one objection to Greg, because I, I want to honor your guys' time, and we've had a really fruitful and long discussion already. Greg only gets one objection? Come on! <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll I'm oh, sure you'll come up with another one, Tom, for him. <laughs> but if that if that were the case, um, then how could we ever say something um, like the resurrection was even good? You know, not, not just that it wasn't just an event, but that it was a good event because God cannot act unilaterally in raising Jesus from the dead. Can He not act unilaterally in the incarnation? Um, obviously, you know, you might say for the incarnation, well, you know, there was a degree in which Mary's will had to play some and role. Jesus. But how, yep. And, and Jesus. But how could we even point to those events? If Does this undercut the very foundation for naming anything in the world as good and from God? Hmm. That's a question. That's a strange question. It does undercut the idea that anything that happens in the world was only or solely or entirely done by God. It does undercut that. But why would it undercut us thinking something is good? Are, are you presupposing that, you know, creation is inherently evil or something? I mean, can't we say that creatures can cooperate with a good God and there's good results? But how would we know it was good? Because wouldn't a sheer, even the sheer act of revelation, that God brings about a revelation that discloses <laughs> what's good from what's evil, wouldn't that very revelation be an act oh, of God? Oh, I think I understand you're saying now. Yeah, so, you're so we asking... wouldn't even have a foundation for ethics. We wouldn't have a foundation for naming that the resurrection, God raised Jesus from the dead, because with these metaphysics, wouldn't we be left with the very equal possibility that, well, he just got out of the grave some other way? Yeah. Here I'm with Greg Boyd, who wrote a book called something like The Benefit of the Doubt. And You're on then, solid ground right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, um, you know what? We cannot be absolutely certain about goodness. We are finite beings with limited capacities. We live by faith, not blind faith, but by true faith. And uh, we trust that what we think is good is somehow finds its foundation in God, inspired by God, revealed by God, all the kind of verbs you want to put in there. So if you're looking for an epistemic foundation to base ethics on, I don't think Christians have to say we have this sure and certain foundation. Now, I do think we should make claims about how we believe by good evidence, by good arguments, that uh, the God of love is the source of our foundation. And this is revealed in Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection. And we can make all those kind of claims. But um, I'm very wary of epistemic certainty. Greg, do you want to respond to any of that before, you know, I ask a, a question of you? Um, yeah, I, 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 this question of what, what do I not, add, what do I edit out? Uh, but, <laughs> but I, I guess it, it would be, look, it, it, it's, and this kind of comes to the, I think the core difference between us. Uh, we both agree God can't, uh, and, and that, that is a big thing. It's not just that God chooses not to, because uh, that's what leads to the blueprint worldview where there's a specific divine reason for everything that God either ordains or allows. So we're, we agree on that. But see, I, 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 want, I want to be able to say that God can act unilaterally. Now, I understand your, your response is, well, if God can unilater act unilaterally to do this miracle, why can't he in all these other ones? And so it raises the problem of evil. But see, that's exactly where, in my view, uh, I can say God, insofar as God gave free agency to creatures, to that degree, God can't act unilaterally. But there's a whole scope of things that aren't included in that free, in, in that free will. And when God gives me free will uh, as, as, a, as a child, uh, say, uh, there's, there's a range of things I have say so over this domain of things. 
Uh, and depending on how my life goes, it may get curved by others, it may get expanded or whatever, but God knows all those possibilities. But there's that leaves open a whole range of things that aren't included in my free will, which leads to my other, really is my, my most fundamental disagreement with, with Tom, and that is, why does love, I, gra- I grant God, God's by nature loving, uh, other-oriented love. I think the cross describes God all the way down. But wh- why think that love, therefore, is completely non uh, controlling. Uh, isn't love sometimes controlling? In fact, yeah, like when, when a parent controls a child, I, I'm not going to let you chase that ball out on the street. Forget your free will. Sometimes love intervenes. But even beyond that, it, it's, it's, um, it, it seems to me that for, for God to create me as a being who is capable of love, it presupposes that most things about me I don't choose. There has to be a given me that, was, that gets to choose. I, and I can only choose, I can only make free decisions because there is a me that I didn't have to choose. It was given to me. Now, what I do with that is up to me. But so I, I didn't choose my gender. I didn't choose, you know, my basic personality, when I was born, how I was, all these things, most of reality is outside of my say so. But that is what allows me to have say so within a little domain of things. And so it seems to me that if you just grab, grab hold of the logic of love being irrevocable, it allows you then to say, well, some things are, are God has to do unilaterally, but some things God can just go ahead and do unilaterally. But it's not an arbitrary decision. It was, it's built into the, God's decision to give us free will in the first place. You, here's your domain to say so, but here's what's outside of that domain. And, and see, that allows me to say, you know, the resurrection was a unilateral thing that God pulled off. And, that, and so for every, whatever other miracle you want to uh, point out. So, yeah, that's, that would be my response. Hmm. Well, Greg, I guess my my question or the the the, the final provocation <laughs> I have for you has to do with probably something that's I would imagine is running through Tom's mind. I've heard you guys have discussions about this together, but it, it gets to if God is capable. So perhaps a pro for some people about Tom's position is a sense of consolation in a moment of suffering, especially like with a natural evil like coronavirus. They come down with that, or a loved one does. There's a sense in which it might be comforting for somebody to feel like, well, God couldn't have done something about it in that moment, right? People that adhere to Tom's position might feel a degree of comfort um, because they can't. In your view, there's still the possibility that God can intervene. And so the question or um, maybe objection I would present is if, let's, again, given the nature, we'll just agree for a moment, this metaphysics, this ontology, that God has constructed reality with these contingent possibilities right. that do not become things to be known until an agent, whether that's human, angelic, who knows, whatever other creatures have agency, maybe robots at some point, right? Till some sentient agent chooses and makes that thing an actuality. W- wouldn't God's infinite intelligence at least have a very, very high degree of predictability in being able to predict in advance? He he lays out the landscape. We have a contingency. Uh, this is a really crude example, right? <laughs> this is very, very limited metaphor. But here's a contingency. Here's a contingency. Here's a contingency. And there's possibly an infinite number of contingencies. Maybe there's a bunch of things that are settled in actualities. Couldn't he, if he's infinitely intelligent... Couldn't he be able to predict with a, not just a high degree of certainty, a hundred percent certainty, the outcome of those events, given the information that God would have holding the very creation together in this very moment. And if he can predict that outcome, why doesn't he step in and intervene more? Couldn't God have seen the Holocaust? Couldn't he have predicted it? Even if it was like, all right, here's a real ontological possibility. Hitler can become the Fuhrer. He can take over Nazi Germany. He can do this. I see that as a possibility. He could also, you know, maybe somebody brings him the gospel when he's a teenager and he becomes a follower of Jesus and now he's a missionary or, you know, that's a real possibility. Seeing those contingencies, couldn't God predict the outcomes? Even if he's not preordaining, couldn't he predict them? And, okay. and step in and intervene more. If, if the future was exhaustively predictable on the basis of present causation, if things in play right now, then God, of course, could perfectly predict the future. But that is just another way of saying, if determinism was true, uh, couldn't God predict the future? Yeah, if determinism was true. 
And determinism is just that everything that will happen in the future is an outworking of causation that's going on right now. And everything that's going on right now is the outworking of causations in, in the past. If you hold that there's free will, genuine free will, then you, then you, I think that entails that you believe that there are possibilities. Free agents could do this or could do that, which by definition means there is no fact to predict. Uh, you can guess which way it will go, but there is, and, and they, they could even assign probabilities, which would be changing over time as circumstances change, render some things more probable, other things less probable. But it's not 100% predictable to the degree that an agent genuinely has free will. And so, why wouldn't yeah, it so be I, though? Because I, 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 isn't there still always a causal mechanism? So, like, we even have the ability now they've done, I'm a basketball fan, and now they have these advanced. Um, analytics. While they can show while a guy is dribbling the ball down the court, they can show from this range, if he's guarded at this point, he has this percentage likelihood of making the shot. Um, behavioral sure. scientists in New Zealand have been able to, sh to demonstrate, they did a simple experiment, they showed people two patterns in an fMRI machine, two images, asked Ooh. them to make a selection. They were able, using the fMRI imagery, to up to 11 seconds before they name their decision, see activity in the brain that gives evidence they are going to point to that. So at what point would God even come to know a decision, right? Is it that 11 seconds? Is it before that? Can't he see the causal chain unfolding, predict it, and then why doesn't he step in and intervene more? If the causal chain is deterministic, God could, absolutely. But see, in all the examples you give there, uh, you're... They're, they're, to the degree that our characters solidify, to the degree that we're habituated, we are at least statistically predictable. Um, and so anyone who's got the right requisite inf information could get, could predict within this range of probability, oh, Greg will do this, or he'll make this basket here, or whatever. But the minute you uh, accept that there is it, something, you can call it self-causation, uh, in some ways, we actually bring about new things. We, are, we, we create. To, to make a decision is to bring about something that has never existed before. You know, I'm right now going to do this. That, that, that never existed before. I, I, I brought this into being. So we really do create new things, whatever it is. Um, and, and, and so there are all there is is possibilities uh, for God to anticipate. And God, I, I think, obviously considers that the risk of evil and all the th wrong things we could do worth, worth, uh, the good that can come about by endowing us with free will, because that's what makes love possible. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't think it's... it's uh, uh, and, and so I would say with, with Tom, I would agree that God is always doing the most... If God's all good, I think that means that God is always doing good. God's always doing the most good that God can do, given the situation, given the kind of world he decided to create, given all that, is always we're doing the most that God can do. So when... A loved one dies of the coronavirus. I don't have any inclination to think, you know, God, why didn't you heal him? Uh, I, I, I think God's will was to heal him. Um, it may be possible that if if, I, if there had been more prayer or if things had been different or if this person hadn't gained so much weight, they, they would have survived. You know, there's all sorts of contingencies like that. But all other things being equal, I'd say that, no, I, I, I don't. If a person understands my thinking, I don't think they would ever be in the position of... Of, of, of grieving the way, uh, like a person who believes that God controls everything would grieve if they, you know, and raise the question, God, why didn't you intervene to unilaterally save my uh, wife from dying or whatever? Uh, you know, the fact that she died, I, I, that wasn't God's will. God grieves over that. Hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a good a good response to the to the to the question here. Um, you know, as we wrap up, guys, and this has been such a blast to do this, I'd, I'd be really interested in, um, I, I think we've mentioned at least at some point for both of you that there has been some explanation of the role that Satan plays. Uh, one final question shared by both of you, and then I'd love to hear from you guys uh, what maybe you guys appreciate about each other's perspective and maybe the core essential difference. Uh, when it when it comes to the role of Satan, you know, Greg, Satan plays a very big role in, in your theodicy. Um, and in some ways, I think it's accurate to say that the early church fathers, pre-Augustine, also had some form of a cosmic dualism, not an ontological dualism like the Gnostics, but that there was a real struggle yeah. going on. Um, the question maybe for both of you, I know, Tom, you're, you're maybe a little bit more agnostic on the role or even how to define what the Satan is. is. Is that something we should actually name as a specific spiritual entity? Um, 
who tempted the tempter? You know, so if we assign, if we assign Greg for you and maybe even Tom to some sort of degree that there are wills and agencies in the universe that go against God's will. And for us as humans, we experience temptation as the temptation of the tempter, Satan, or his demons, or it could be, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just our own wills and volitions and appetites. Mm -hmm. When did that first, when did the first sin, what caused and brought about that first instance of sin, the thing that we would name as evil? Is there Some any people ex- say that there's a woman to blame, but I know <laughs> it's my own damn fault. <laughs> Wasted away in Margaritaville. <laughs> you, you know, here's the thing. Do you need a tempter to sin? It, it seems to me that uh, even in Genesis 3, you've got the serpent there, but it's when Eve decides to uh, imagine a, an alternative reality than the one that the creator has, has given her. Uh, I could... You know, she looks at the tree, and the tree appears good now. And she's looking at it, it could make me wise. And then she's imagining walking a different way than what the creator says we should walk. She's, she's really now becoming lord of her own reality. I get to choose reality, and that, I think, is the essence of all sin. And we can do it on our own. I, I think you know, the, the, uh, there are some suggestions, at least in the New Testament, that uh, it, Satan fell. He wasn't created evil. He, he, he was a moral agent, and the angels fell. They left their first estate, says in Jude. Um, that tells me that they had free agency and uh, uh, that they, they imagined an alter- alternative reality. Uh, I don't have to bow down before God. I, I could, and it must have been you know, plausible to them. You can create a plausible scenario where it's in your best interest to break ranks with God. Uh, and I think that's the essence of all sin. So I don't think you need a, uh, the tempter doesn't need to be tempted. So God intentionally then allowed for agents to imagine alternative possibilities. I think that's what it is to give free will. Okay. We, 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 can, we can consciously submit our plans, our agenda uh, to our Lord, or we can say, I want to do my own thing, go my own way, and, and uh, you know, create your own reality. And that's, you, in, in essence, you're playing God, and I think that's, that is the essence of all sin. Tom, what about this question for you? Well, as I said earlier, my view doesn't require belief in the devil or demons. But just for the sake of this little uh, game or games i don't mean it sound for thought experiment. Thought experiment. Yeah. Thought experiment. It's a thought experiment um let's say that there were demonic beings prior to the creation of the world and those demonic beings or angelic beings somehow decided not to do what god wanted and we now call them demons um your question is who tempted them I'm in agreement with Greg here. We don't have to think there's yet another tempter that's before those. I'm with uh, also the the writer of James who says that when you, when we're tempted, we shouldn't say God tempted us, but we're drawn away by our own natural desires and enticed. Mm-hmm. But then the question becomes, um, what is it that they're desiring? How did they get those the possibility for desires? And here Greg and I are both gonna talk about freedom and agency, et cetera. But just a realm of possibility to do evil, where did that come from? Where are those possibilities? And um, here again, I think it helps us to maybe begin to question the creation out of nothing view. I mean, if these angelic beings are not gods, they are created. If they're not created, they're eternal. If they're eternal, then you've got an eternal creaturely other alongside of God, which is not creation out of nothing. So you've got something there. If they are created by God, then uh, one wonders, okay, where did they, what did God create them out of? Um, So it kind of backs up the argument a little bit. Greg's actually dealt with this in some of his writings. But I, I want to alert uh, the people who are part of this conversation to, um, to be aware of the possibility that uh, the question of pre-creation angelic beings moves back the question of creation of uh, nothing another step. And I think, at least from my perspective, um, might prompt one to look for an alternative to creation out of nothing. But the church has always taught that angels... Satan, they're, they're, they're part of creation. They're created. Yeah, but uh, I'm postulating here. Um, I have always 
I've been under the impression that in some way the devil pre-existed the world or creation. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, it's just maybe it's just well. Folklore. There's certainly you know certainly origins viewpoint, which was in keeping with Neil. Neoplatonic thought that you have a, a spiritual act of creation and a, on a sense a material act of creation, yeah. and, and there could be two acts of two acts of creation. And this is purely speculative because the the biblical witness doesn't give us a metaphysical backstory on any of this stuff, which would have been nice. But I, yeah. I don't see it there. I don't. Do you guys see it there <laughs> in the well, scriptures? There, there are possible hints and stuff, but it, yeah, it's certainly not clear. But it's a question of what is the order of creation, not whether or not they're created. So yeah, yeah. some of the church held that Satan fell you know, before uh, the earth was created. Some held that after humans were created out of jealousy. And you have the watcher tradition that thought that you know the angels fell just before the flood. Right. So you've got a number of motifs going on there, but all of them agree that they were created. Right. Well, as we conclude, guys, I'd love to hear from each of you, maybe one thing that you'd say, hey, you know what, I, I really appreciate this about Greg's effort or Tom's effort, even if I disagree, and maybe the the one point that you go, but I can't see it this way because of this. I'll uh, I'll start with you, Tom. All right. Well, I've been kind of drawing some notes here, um, and I want to talk about three things, but I want to begin by uh, just reminding everyone that Greg and I agree on a ton of stuff, and uh, our differences are important. I'm not trying to minimize, minimize those, but if you were to put Greg and I up with a hundred other professional theologians, uh, you know, we're we have so much more in common than we probably would with the other ninety That's uh, true. in there. Um, the first of my three is I want to respond to Greg's concern about whether or not love is ever controlling. Um, he gave an example of a parent controlling a child in the name of love. And this is one of the issues that I've dealt with, especially in my Love Can't book, but in some others. Um, I think one of the important differences between parents using their bodies to sometimes thwart the freedom of their kids uh, and God doing that is that God doesn't have a localized physical body like parents do. God is a incorporeal universal spirit. Um, I won't go into details on that, but it gives, gives you an idea of where I might go. Second thing I want to mention, and this is more of a challenge to Greg uh, rather than a response. Um, I think Greg's, one of his weak positions is his admission that he doesn't have a theory on the mechanism or the way that the satanic beings engaged with um, inanimate matter, or if not inanimate matter, uh, non-free will creatures in creation. I think, um, yeah, that I, I wish he had a theory there. I, he's got lots of other really good theories, and I agree with a lot of them, but that seems like a hole that I would love to see him um, step up on, or uh, fill in in some way. And finally, uh, one thing that we agree on that's kind of maybe a minor issue, but it kind of got passed over, and I just want to make sure I mention it. Um, I also have a view that we in the afterlife can continually to cooperate with God such that we develop a certain kind of character. Uh, I don't think that it, uh, it removes entirely the freedom to do other than what God wants. But I do strongly agree with Greg that if you have a character inclined toward love, you're uh, not, it's not inevitable that you'll love, but it's highly likely you're inclined that way. So that's kind of a, a minor detail, but one I wanted to uh, affirm with Greg. Greg, what uh, about for you? Me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, the main thing is I, 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 both Tom and I agree that it's, it's uh, permissible and even necessary to say God can't. Uh, and, and that, that is huge, uh, cause it's either God chooses not to, or God can't and, and, um, uh, chooses not to can create all, I mean, that, that, that goes on to your character of God. It goes on to everything. It messes your, and I think a person's picture of God, mental conception of God is the most important thing. So we agree on, I think the most important thing. Um, but, uh, the, the weakest, the, the weakest area I, I, I still think is the inference that, uh, or the assumption that it, it, God's loving nature means that God is non-controlling. I would agree that it, God's loving nature means that God doesn't exhaustively control. Um, but to say that 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 God uh, can't ever act unilaterally is, I think, a, a serious metaphysical constraint 
And in my opinion, it's not necessary once you understand the limitations that God puts on himself by choosing to create the kind of world where there are free agents. Uh, if you can say that some things are, are up to free will and some things aren't, well, that I think is all you need to explain what needs to be explained. And you don't have to put this other metaphysical constraint on God. So that's my main uh, objection to his view. Boy, I turned on my music accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a good way to end. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Tom, for this discussion. I do. Oh, it's not gosh. just in your head. <laughs> I'll just mute you temporarily, Greg, as you hit. Yeah, there you go. Got it. Oh, well, this sorry. was incredibly insightful. You guys have given me a lot of things to chew on. But you muted on. yourself. I can't hear you. Oh, am I muted? No, no. I think you just turned down your you. speakers, Greg. <laughs> I think you muted I, me. I, I, or, or did I try to find? No, this is oh. this is evidence that Zoom brain is setting in. It's a real thing, uh, <laughs> sent from the enemy. I uh, <laughs> love it. So I'm really thankful for this conversation, you guys. I, I appreciate the relationship you guys have. I appreciate the um, the way in which you model conversations around these things. That's just as important, if not more important, than the contents of what you have to say. I think it's uh, a good witness to the world. It's a good witness to others in our Christian family. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the time. You've been really generous in sharing it together. Uh, I will make sure to include any relevant uh, books that you guys see most fit. Uh, do any come to mind before we wrap up that you say, hey, you know, check out these ones. Tom, what would be the one or two books in your collection that you would say, hey, check this out if you're interested in my view? Well, I wrote this book called The Uncontrolling Love of God, which is kind of a more academic kind of book. Uh, then I followed it up with a book called God Can't that we've mentioned. And then this, just this summer, I wrote a book called Questions and Answers for God Can't. And some of the questions you had today are addressed in that book. Great. Greg, what about for you? Where would you turn people? Uh, what I books can't would you say? hear you because I can't turn my music off. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> All right, let me answer for Greg. He would recommend that you read Crucifixion of a Warrior God. There you go. Uh, I heard that. One. <laughs> uh, but also you would read uh, God at War. No, is it God yeah, at War? Satan and the, the Problem after? of Evil and God at War, right? Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, Satan and the Problem of Evil. If, if what what he said. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I can't find how to shoot this music off. I'll throw in two, one for Greg. <laughs> uh, God of the Possible. That might be one that might be a more, more, little more popular at the popular level. Accessible. Uh, uh, the yeah, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys. Um, we'll, uh, we're just uh, really, really thankful for this conversation. Uh, and we'll provide all these relevant links, ways for people to connect with you and reach out to you. Thank you.